is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. So today we're doing a double header. Right. Which means we're doing also two POVs from the cleansing. So do you want to do like cleansing chapter, cleansing chapter, or how do you wanna how do you wanna arrange this? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I really do feel like I'm going to need a treat after each Elaine chapter. So I'm thinking that to get me through this dinner of really tough steak that may have been slightly overcooked, maybe boiled in some water for a while before it got (laughs) fried up, uh, I'm going to need some sweet dessert that is the Forsaken POV. And that is just just. Mm, that's a sugary dessert right there. A little bit of land fear confirmation, all sorts of things going on in that. Okay, but then we've also got the uh, she's channeling Saedine. We've got that heartbreaker. Right. That's what I'm talking about. The, the winner's heart stuff is just, I mean, some of the best cleansing stuff we get. And then we have what's happening on the other side of the world. And the, the hours do seem to match up, right? They Both do. seem to they be do. a couple of hours into this this process. So, yeah, so far, this, this smearing seems to be working. The smearing of Winter's Heart is working re- remarkably well. Yeah, well, I say we start with an Elaine chapter because I need something to motivate me to get through them. All right. <laughs> There's <laughs> not. And again, as with all these chapters, there are nuggets in there. There are things I want to talk about. Um, um, but in between that, there's just a lot of names and a lot of empty, empty paragraphs of descriptions and r- relationships that are are hard to even bring yourself to care about because they're characters that are either only in this chapter or, you know, essentially characters that exist as a group, right? These three Aes Sedai, those four kinswomen, these eight uh, Windfinders, right? Like they're all essentially, you know, if you can substitute that person's name for their category and nothing changes right it's hard to talk about them (laughs) yeah i also find that the filler text of these chapters is some of the weakest writing yes that you can find in the whole series there's so many times when the filler text is really interesting. It gives you world building. It gives you subtle relationships. It gives you foreshadowing. This is just words on a page t- for reasons that escape me. There's all this bickering about tea. There's all these descriptions about the dampness of hair. And it's just like, what does any of this add up to? There are so many chapters where the exact same word count with the exact same amount of apparent importance at the surface would have so much underneath it. And this just doesn't. And it's not the bath that's the problem. It's all the filler text around the bath. And we we lump it all onto the bath as being the problem. But it's really the filler text of these chapters is just like, why is this not all on the cutting room floor? You know, I can speculate. <laughs> I can speculate as to why it's not on the cut- cutting room floor. What I will say is that next book, which I am currently listening to in audio form because I'm trying to get ahead of the podcast. Next book, such a difference. Oh, my God. Next book is so oh, good, yeah. you guys. You guys, you guys, did you it's know? Amazing. Did you know that these books don't suck? If you can just get to the next book, it's amazing how fast my whole mood has changed now that I've gotten well into Knife of Dreams. Like, oh, my God. No, and and there are so even the last three books are are very, very good with Brandon Sanderson. There are parts of them I do not like, but I think as a whole and certainly almost every chapter is very, very good in those books. But Knife of Dreams is it, the one thing that I love about Knife of Dreams is it was such a good final book for Robert Jordan. Yeah, yeah. It it, it doesn't follow this one at all. <laughs> this no. one is ugh, no in so many ways, and Knife of Dreams is just oh, it's such a breath of fresh air. And I can see what he's trying to do. That he's like basically, hey, I know this is a lot of characters in a lot of places. Let's pause for a moment, right during the cleansing, on the day of the cleansing, and just catch up. Let's see where everybody is. This is that that episode in the middle of the anime where they sit down for like an interview and do a bunch of like recap because they don't want to draw any new scenes. 
So they just have like their character talking heads talking, and then they flash back to like scenes from earlier in the anime to recap you on what's been going on. And you're like, what a waste of an episode. But you know, there's a lot going on, and we want you to be, you know, all on the same page before the ending comes. And that's what this book does for me. Yeah, yeah. And so in this chap in this set of chapters today, we're going to be really examining how Elaine as proto queen deals with her identity both as a channeler and just as a political operative because that's really what this is first she deals with the sea folk as a queen Aes Sedai and then she deals with some high seats as a queen who isn't queen yet and it's really just the here's how Elaine's plot arc stuff is happening and if this was the only stuff we got from Elaine's succession arc I think I would actually find it quite interesting I feel like there's a lot of the the stuff that we've been talking about is in these chapters. It's just that it's like the eighth time we've hit some of these beats. And so right. it doesn't right. have any oomph. I'm like, I know. I mean, the kids in the second chapter of today's doubleheader, those those are not new or those are not old. Those are new. No, and that is those refreshing. are new. But then they don't really go anywhere, this, which makes go, them. They try. Uh, they try. They try. They almost. They almost do, but yeah, like I said, the, the, it's the the beginning of a very short plot line. Yeah, yeah. With that, should we begin on what is undoubtedly not going to be a short episode because it's us? <laughs> because it's us, and it's two plus chapters, and there's no way we're going to be short. Yeah. Do you want to get started on chapter bath time? Bath time. The infamous bath, which I was shocked is not the whole chapter. It's just the first half of the chapter. It's like a quarter of the text of the chapter is about the bath, like explicitly. That's true. In word count, it is a lot. I will give you that. It's so much bath. But this is the bath. The bath of the entire series. This is the emblematic poster child bath. Here we are. And the chapter title actually is a bargain. And the chapter header is the stylized birds sea folk yeah, seagulls sea folk, sea, seagulls yeah um, because it's a bargain it's the sea folk and it's bath time it's bath time water water and sass water and sass all right i'm gonna read us in this very boring paragraph but it's how we do on this <laughs> podcast so here we go oh man just just throwing a lot of shade at robert jordan right now <sighs> all right A bath was not hard to find, though Elaine had (laughs) to wait in the hall, frowning at the lion-carved doors of her apartments, drafts flickering on the mirrored stand lamps while Rosoria and two of the guardswomen went in to search. Once they were sure there were no assassins lying in wait, and guards had been arrayed in the corridor and outer room, Elaine entered to find white-haired Asanda waiting in the bedchamber with Neris and Sephany, the two young tirewomen she was training. Asanda was slim, with Elaine's golden lily embroidered over her left breast and a very great dignity emphasized by her deliberate way of moving, though some of that came from age and aching joints she refused to acknowledge. Neris and Stephanie were sisters, fresh-faced, sturdy and shy-eyed, proud of their livery and happy to have been chosen out for this rather than cleaning hallways, but almost as much in awe of Asanda as of Elaine. There were more experienced maids available, women who had worked years in the palace, but sadly, girls who had come seeking any sort of work they could find were safer. It's a bath situation. There are maids because princess. Neris and Stephanie are another little like pair that just sort of exist in the background. Neris and Stephanie and Asanda, and they're there for flavor. They don't do anything and I think important. Killed in Semarog's attack, at least one of them is. What? When Semarog takes out. Rand? Neris and Stephanie? Am I? Oh, oh, those are the, sorry, the servants. Yeah. I'm thinking of the Aes Sedai. Yeah, no, no, The Aes Sedai also come as a little group. Yeah. See, too many little groups of women with S M- names, right. Jordan. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, these are just these two maids, and Elaine has, has thoughts about them constantly whenever they're in the scene, because they're, like, getting trained by Asanda, and we need to think about the relationship of servants and the people they serve a whole bunch. And so they just exist for flavor text and world building. They don't do anything critical or important. I don't even think they die. They just exist in the palace as NPCs. You gotta have your NPCs. I mean, how else? At least we, uh, at the end of this, we get with uh, 
two more important mistress harfor and master nori i think they come back in at the end of these two chapters right do they they might yeah yeah they or they're going to they're going to yeah that's they have announced that they're on their way <sighs> at the end of these two chapters yes indeed <laughs> we get a meeting with them again in the next next uh, episode so yeah, we, we get reminded about how Avienda feels about bathing and about how Asanda feels about talking during bathing and about how Brigida doesn't care what either of them think about bathing. She's just going to be Brigida. Uh, okay, I love this line. Hot water might have been the greatest single gift of civilization. Or, you know, channeling, right? Like, it could, you could always channel it warmer. It could be warmer. I do not understand why one of the most powerful channelers in the world insists on having manual labor and allowing the water to just to, to, to just cool down. Like two of two of if she's got Avienda right there. Who's not that much weaker than her, two. especially not with that turtle. And and I just I wonder if that's part of why Rafe made that the opening scene of channeling in the show was like, just for the record, you can make baths warm forever. Jordan, I, I just I right. want to feel like that was Rafe throwing some shade at Jordan being like, why did she let the bath get cold in chapter 12 of Crossroads of Twilight? <laughs> I'm, I'm choosing to believe that Rafe and I are out. on the same wavelength here. <laughs> it's a very specific call out. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You may be pushing that one a little bit, but I, there, but there's no doubt that like baths are a theme in the Wheel of Time. And this particular bath is sort of the penultimate bath that the penultimate's not used correctly in that sentence no, it's not. um <laughs> i think just ultimate <laughs> the only just way ultimate to make that bath work. scene yeah yeah um the ultimate bath scene that was is sort of i mean there's definitely i think i really like the boys and tom in the bath i think that's a really good one where tom's kind of giving them advice mm -hmm. in the in the end in the marilon yeah i think that's a great scene um but and there's others scattered throughout too but this one Seems to be one that is remembered, or at least bemoaned the, about the most. But no, but you're you're right because because she's right that hot water is one of the greatest gifts of civilization. It's just weird to have a woman who can have hot water with a flick of her mental wrist, being so excited about like wood heated and footstep carried buckets of water. And even if the the pregnancy is interfering with her ability to channel, Avienda's right there. Right. She never even thinks about how she could channel to heat the world. Like, what? It's too mundane. You're going to use up the power on, like, shut up. Like, you've demonstrated so easily that heating, like, maybe it's just that it would be too much work. Maybe the show radically is, is, is confusing me about how much energy it takes to heat a part. Cause we do know that, that, like, I mean, how many, it's supposed to be like rough, it's, it's work to channel, right? So you could say, like, caloric value out right but you can throw fireballs right without a problem all if they can throw fireballs all day they can heat up a little bit of water I, you would think you i'm would just think. saying i'm just i'm trying to find a way that this isn't a glaring plot hole in one of the most infamous annoying scenes. and certainly they talk about moving heat right you don't have to generate that heat from scratch you don't have to come up with it all with the energy you can actually you know be your own air conditioner and move heat from one location to another be your own and that location could be the bath yeah right suck suck the heat out of the stone uh you know wall over there and put it in the bath right yeah the stone's gonna get super cold but your bath will warm up yeah they say never pull it into yourself. Remember, that's how because Rand talks about pulling it yeah, into yeah. himself, then dispersing it. And you can't do that as a female channeler, but you can redistribute it from one inanimate object to another. Mm -hmm. And like they put like little threads of fire into their wine to heat it up all the time. Yep. So like all the time, I just I, I don't. I, I mean, I guess it. other than being careful not to boil yourself alive by accident by using a little too much, maybe step out of the tub first well, before sure, you. Sure, that seems before, reasonable, like, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> if you're not sure about your control and how exactly how much heat you're pulling out, right? Like flash boiling the tub could be a problem, especially if you're sitting in it. Uh, like those people in in the apocryphal myths of what happens at hot springs doesn't actually happen, but maybe. Maybe that one time that you maybe kind of heard of. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're telling me that somebody didn't jump in after their dog into Yellow Springs Hot Springs and have the flesh melt off? Oh, of no, them? that happened. That definitely okay. happened. Okay, okay. That happened. But, like, the whole idea that you could be in a hot spring, like, 
chilling out and then it just like gets hot and boils you like in dante's peak oh okay i don't know that that's ever actually happened that the water changes so rapidly that people who are frolicking get boiled instantly gotcha definitely people have fallen and jumped into pools of water they should not have been in and have boiled and died instantly that has happened but that's different because the water was already hot yeah also unpleasant Uh, i went to yellowstone with my mom and my mom has a very vivid imagination and so she likes to fill it with factual information rather than speculation so i learned all kinds of cool ways to die in yellowstone when we went there because she hyper focused on all the ways people have died in yellowstone (laughs) Dumb ways to die. Oh, seriously. So many I dumb ways song. to die. <laughs> <laughs> it's a train safety song. Downloaded a iPhone game and was playing it. Oh, called nice. Dumb ways to die, which is definitely based on the the animations. Yeah, uh, it was fun. Yeah, it's an Aust- yeah. it's an Australian rail safety slogan mm-hmm. campaign. Mm-hmm. My mom sent it to me years ago because she's obsessed with trains. <laughs> and yeah, the, it's so graphic. All right, so the next thing I have is sort of a treatise on why gateways are important when you're in a siege and why she needs the windfinders because they're the only ones who really have the power other than a couple of kin to make the gateways on a regular basis, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which becomes the foundational bit of information you need for the um, negotiations in the next section, right? You you need to know that what she needs the sea folk for are the gateways. Yes, the gateways are a linchpin in her entire plan how she's managing this if she doesn't have that then everything else falls apart because i mean she's under siege right but like it's not much of a siege if you can just you know gateway to wherever who's ever selling grain right like but that depends on gateways being available frequently and all the time right that was kind of her standoff with taim in the black tower was like you're right, I can't stop you from gatewaying anywhere you want, but I can at least make it so that way you have to gateway everywhere to get your food. I can at least impose that level of difficulty. And now she's being backed into the same corner, and then what the sea folk are about to hand her is, and we're going to take away your capacity to make those gateways. All but nine. All but nine. <laughs> well, they walk in there saying, all but none, and she manages to pull that number up to nine, which is a huge victory for her, and takes a whole last chapter to get through it's a long bargain yep then there's a little bit of uh Gawain forgiveness here oh yeah little, Egwene uh, had been besieging besieging Tarvalon with her army for more than a week and it would be the cruelest spinning of fate for Gawain to be caught between his oaths to defend the tower and his love for Egwene gee you think <laughs> <laughs> I almost wish he, they'd done more with that, right? Like, because he doesn't really get caught between those two. He just sort of goes with the Gwen. I mean, yeah. He never tries to go back to Elaine. Right. He doesn't try to go back to Elaine until he's proving a point with a Gwen. It's very frustrating. But, you know, she is giving him the benefit of the doubt and assuming that he actually has two brain cells to rub together. Which is fair, because she's always had a soft spot for him, so of course she's going to give him the benefit of the doubt and assume that he actually has information and reason to work with. Have you seen the latest explanation for why Gawain sucks so much uh, later on in the books? No. It's been going around the internet? No. Brain damage from the staff fight with Matt. Matt smacked him over the head so hard (laughs) with his staff, he literally caused uh, issues with his frontal brain and his decision-making capabilities. I feel like I have heard this before, and it's definitely also been pointed out that Elaine has had far more than a healthy person's share of head trauma injuries. So the Tracans are just running around <laughs> with all kinds of brain injuries, and we're just we're just letting them run the story, I guess. That's that's smart. What royals with serious brain issues and um cognitive disabilities? I can't think of any other time when that would have happened. In our world. Yeah. And the next chapter definitely doesn't make a good argument against giving people power just because of who their parents were. Yeah. Then there's a bit here. Galad fancied Nynaeve or had for a time. I'm like, that was a while. Like, what? Didn't he fancy Egwene first? Mm -hmm. Or I don't remember. Yeah, when they were in the tower, Galad was totally mooning over Egwene. Yeah. And that's why Gawain was staying out of the way. Right. And then later, after Galad had joined with the White Cloaks and they were in Samara, 
that was when Galad apparently was really being like, no, I really like you, Nynaeve, in Elaine's eyes. I don't know. I don't know if he necessarily fancied them so much as was reasonably polite to them and Delane's just over-interpreting that. I mean, he did have a crush on Egwene, for sure, but I don't know that he ever was more than polite to Nynaeve. That's what I was trying to remember. When I mean, other than a pretty face, right? This is the whole, like, Gal- we know Gallad falls for a pretty face because he falls for Barrelane later. But, yeah, I'm trying to, trying to remember, like, I think he just was like, oh, she's pretty. And then he got to know her and was like, oh, she's awful. Right. It was <laughs> like, like, I don't remember him at, ever really liking her. Yeah, I think he made one comment about how she was pretty once. Like, but I, I think Elaine's just maybe making a lot out of that. Uh, for Elaine, that is the basis for a long term relationship. True. With, you know, that's how she decided to get with Rand. True. Let's see. After the comments about Gollum and Gawain, she talks about the Silver Swan, which I think is another, I want to say, failed plot line. Like that very much here we get confirmation that like the the sisters there are working for Codswain, as far, as far as I can tell. We talked about this before and come to the conclusion that they're. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you to remind me because I'm sure that we've talked about this, but I couldn't remember. Like, what are these sisters doing? Remind me. They are at the beck of call in Codswain, and they, you know, like the ones went down to spy for her, but we never. That's one of those things where Sanderson really never mentions them again. Okay. Yeah. That was what I thought. It was like, it's just, yeah, it's one of those dead end plots, which is. It's what, like, mm. it's clear that Jordan wanted to do something with them and wanted Codswain to sort of call them up and be like, here are my Aes Sedai, who are now the, the dragon sworn Aes Sedai, right? The, or something. I don't know. Like, they're sort of, and he sets them up here as the third aspect and maybe maybe he sort of wanted to have independent eyes to die after the tower was re uh, forged back together maybe there would be this third aspect of them who weren't who you know were separate and the, and the only way to bring that them back in was to make cod swain amarillin seat and maybe that's why in the notes she becomes amarillin seat right like is i, I don't know like I'm, I'm making something up but it seems like Jordan had an idea of what he wanted to do with these Aes Sedai. And either that never got written down in his notes or it just didn't make it into the final uh, trilogy. Yeah. But I, I don't know. There's there's nothing that happens with these Aes Sedai in particular. They're not even they're not like accounted for when the tower reunites or anything like that. They're not part of either group. They're not really mentioned when the whole city is burned to the ground and invaded. They're right. not like, oh, and then the sisters in the Silver Swan fought back. Like, there's no mention of them as far as I can tell. So It's very frustrating. You want to think that there's stuff there. If this was book one, you know that every one of those would come up later. But no, now we're in book one zero, and <sighs> things have changed. <laughs> there's also a uh, fun paragraph here part of a paragraph just about kind of how the Aes Sedai work. In truth, most sisters looked forward to a sitting monarch who was also Aes Sedai, the first in a thousand years and the first since the breaking of the world to be openly known as Aes Sedai. But Elaine would not be surprised to find there was a sister in Aramilla's camp keeping discreetly out of notice. The White Tower never placed all of its coin on one horse unless the race was fixed. And I like that because that reminds you of how big and slow some of the white tower moves are and that's maybe a way to sort of headcanon patch this thing with the eyes to die that never gets resolved is just there are schemes within schemes moving at glacial paces and we just can't ever get to it all and you can just kind of hand wave that because literally i think elaine's right that there is definitely a way for the white tower to come out having always backed the eventual queen of this fight even though they want it to be Elaine, they absolutely won't be on the losing side if Elaine loses also. I think she's right about that. The other thing we've got here is about the Reds, the ones that had been passing through looking to go to the Black Tower. 
Um, right, the, right. The last pair had ridden out of the city the day after Aramilla appeared. So that's sort of an interesting thing to note that that particular passive sister that's the timing. to the Black Tower. Yeah, that timing of the, their arc against the siege. Just, you know, all these moving parts are happening within very close proximity to each other. We also get that it's been a week since Egwene has moved her troops to the White Tower, right? So again, like all that happened at the end of book seven (laughs) and that was a week ago yeah in this timeline and we're in book 10 i mean that's that's why you know when this law that that's what this log is is like we're we're going over a couple of months maybe it was the end of book eight but you know a couple of months uh are happening in these books and everything's so compressed it it feels like the plot doesn't move forward even though individual storylines are let's see comments on Codswain, Van Dien did not think much of the woman, calling her opinionated and mule-headed. <laughs> I kind of love Van Dien for that. Yes, <laughs> old lady recognizing fellow old uh-huh. lady. <laughs> uh-huh. Two old ladies were like, nah, she's a bitchy old bitty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that. And then Kareen, the dark friend. Almost fainted in awe. Wow. Oh, mm-hmm. So scary. So impressive. Get reminded that, yeah, the Aes Sedai are split into thirds, one for Egwene, one for Elida, and one for whoever comes out on top in the end. And then we get interrupted by the sea folk barging into the bath situation. They basically force their way into the inner sanctum and Elaine is forced to get out of the bath quickly to deal with them rather than literally receive them in her bath. Right. How, again, one of the reasons why I think this chapter is so fucking annoying is that the sea folk are just really rude and it's just like it's needlessly rude and it's this is not the sea folk i remember from the first books right and the irony is that this is one of the only times we see a bargain actually go down and it's kind of fun i kind of actually like the bargain itself even though the lead up to it is yeah like a total betrayal of the promise of book two book three sea folk right the, the sea folk who are just unfailing, pol- failingly polite and always very formal, yes, but never rude like this, never mean, never. They they wanted to trick you into a deal you didn't realize. They didn't want to browbeat you into a deal. Well, also, though, when we first met them, we were meeting some fairly mid rank sea folk, and now we're dealing with the very top of their governance. And that's one of RJ's theses is, is that if you get to the top of the social pyramid, everyone's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but we never get to see anyone from the sea folk except the very very tip of their pyramid and so it sucks because when we first met them it was like some rank and file people and i get that they're they're away from their sea they've been fugitives for a while they're you know but at this point i'm like dude make make some gateways home right there's no reason why y'all need to feel like you're in exile still. Well, okay, no. I'm going to push back on that. This is the day that they learned that their wave mistress was impaled by the Shan Chan. Oh, uh, well, okay. Their their diplomatic feathers are more than a little ruffled at this point. Fair enough. They They are learning that they need to pick a new president because the invaders stabbed the old one. And so they're like, all right, we need to right quick make a bargain and go the fuck home. And so like, we're going to barge it on her in her bath. Like, we need to get home now and we can't leave without some kind of parting exchange. Because it's literally day up. They come in wearing white armbands and un- open the exchange with announcing the news that uh, What's-Her-Face got killed. They're pushing a Brigida into the room and then being, look, you tripped on your boots. Clumsy. It's very Aiel, right? The idea because... Oh, wetlanders, or in this case, drylanders, wear boots, which is ridiculous. They should just, you know, wear bare feet like the rest of us on our decks <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. get nice calluses. And so you're all, all you drylanders are clumsy in your boots, right? Like, so I didn't push you. You just stumbled. Yeah. Yeah. You're not just shore bound. You're boot bound. <laughs> boot bound. <laughs> I mean, hey, I'm, I'm the first one to agree with them. I'm, I'm one of those weird hippies who loves bare feet and think that we should all, that shoes are ac- actively damaging our, our feet the way we wear them they're too tight there are many people who make that argument i am not one of them (laughs) my feet are (laughs) collapsing and tender and need shoes desperately but um, or are they collapsing and tender because of the shoes well the tenderness is because of the shoes the collapsing is because apparently i have connective tissue issues 
so ah yes well that's yes i guess my feet are flattening i don't know i haven't been to a podiatrist in a really long time but no there's there's a lot of arguments for all this highfalutin shoe technology being more trouble than it's worth that yeah the number of ankle and knee injuries since nike introduced thick sold sold shoes have gone up drastically yeah it's one of those things where you're like are, are you helping your feet with those things or are you just putting a brace around your foot that weakens the muscles in your foot that forces you to brace your foot right like there's something to be said for not getting rusty metal shoved into the flesh of your foot like the concept oh, sure. of shoes has some yeah. merit but like maybe think about it and that's right you know and, and i'm never you know in terms of bare feet i do think you know more of the sandal right the thin sole something that has some penetration protection i don't go around barefoot because that's gross but man, the thick soles that we put on sh- most shoes, I feel like is just really bad for us. A little too rigid. Anyway, that's my own personal little side rant that I can go on. If you're interested, you know, call me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I need shoes. So yeah, the wind folk don't. No, they, they don't. They also apparently don't need manners. Uh, there's a there's a great you never invited me to bathe with you, though that would have been courteous. But we will not speak of it. Just just pointing up that, that there's a, so, so much lack of cultural communication happening. These people are trying to, to interface, but they're also not making any effort to learn who they're interfacing with. And it's to the detriment of all. Do you think they take a lot of baths when they're at sea? My, my money's on no, right? I feel like salt water's not great for your skin in high profusion and it's not like they have a lot of clean water you you can't bathe in fresh water on a boat right like yeah that's a little a little perplexing maybe they like collect rainwater on their ships maybe bathe in it i would assume that basically what they do is they pull up anchor and go swimming around the the boat every once in a while because they're portrayed as excellent swimmers Yeah, yeah yeah but like they also talk about having bathing rituals specifically Right. Multiple times, there's discussions of bathing rituals that sound kind of like how the Aiel use sweat tents to socialize. So then, do you think those bathing rituals only take place on land, or are those ship-based bathing rituals? That's that's what I'm trying to figure out. The way that they talk about their life on ships, you it implies it's all on the ship, but like the the feasibility of that is is not working in my mind. So. Same. I mean, unless you're taking saltwater baths, Which that's the only possibility. Seem like a thing let us know i mean i i you know certainly you can take maybe you take a saltwater bath and then do a bit of a freshwater sponge off at the end right just to get the salt off but you're mostly cleaning yourself with the salt water i i i don't know i don't know i, I, I feel like <laughs> less time spent on making them smarmy assholes and more time on explaining the feasibility of their cultural practices would have helped <laughs> <laughs> helped us yes uh spinnacle saying we're trying very hard to make this chapter interesting yes yes we are it's it's a skill <laughs> not saying we are skilled at it just that at it is it. A no skill. it is a skill that we are trying we are trying for sure so yes the introduction that nesta is done we met her um, way back when. That's who negotiations were with, right? On the which deal did they make with her? The Bull of the Winds. The Bull of the Winds, right? Because she was like led all that, and yeah, she was a pretty big deal for all of that. Yeah, she's like the the president of the Sea Folk or whatever, and she's been impaled to death because of her role in the Great Escape, facilitated by Matt in Abu Dar, right? I believe you. I do not remember that. Because she was part of that with... Uh, oh, man. I, I forgot to look up Nesta before this. I feel like you were blowing my mind with that when we were with Matt doing the Great Escape situation. That's entirely possible. Um, the the sea fo- I can learn things about the Sea Folk and then forget them again. That's entirely reasonable. Oh, she marries N- Lan and Nynaeve. Oh! She's their, she's their officiant. Yeah. That's the last time we heard of her. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure that Matt mentions that she's one of the heads on spikes over the wall, right? Yeah, when, in Winter's Heart, Chapter 16, when Matt returns to Ebu Dar, he sees the heads of the mistress of the ships and her master of the blades on the poles outside the gate. So she must have participated in the rebellion. So she must have gotten captured by the sea folk then, right? 
By the Sean Chan? Sean Chan, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so she must have been, like, on the chain gangs cleaning out the canals or cleaning up the Rahad, and then Matt lets the Windfinders go. Or no, she's a Windfinder, right? Nessa Dinarias was a Windfinder? No, she's uh, Mistress of the Ships. She was Mistress of the Ships. So, yeah, she would have been just one of the ones out on the chain gang. Renaila's her Windfinder. And then when Matt let all of the Windfinders go... Renyla would have been one of those windfinders, or no, Renyla Ren- wasn't there. But anyway, they would have gone down and found their mistress of the ships and been like, "Hey, we're we're all bailing out of here. We're doing a great escape." She would have clearly been like on the last ship to leave, right? She wasn't going to leave with any of her people behind. Clearly, she got captured and killed. Um, but the news has only just reached the Andoran-based sea folk now. And they say also that between that news and whatever the fuck is happening in the West, there can be no delay. They need a leader now. They don't know what that beacon is, but they know that the sea folk can't be leaderless while that thing and its fallout happen. Also, Red Island does get sent to the Silver Swan to question the Aes Sedai about the disappearance of Talon. Uh, So that's another uh, uh, connection between the the parts of this chapter. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. So, so basically she says she's taken all the sea folk away and Elaine thinks absolutely not. And suddenly now she's willing to be interrupted from her bath, right? She goes from, I'm going back into my bath right now to, oh, no, no, we need to talk. We need some wine. We need to figure this out. <laughs> this is like when you go in your boss, like, hey, I need to talk. And he's like, not now. You're like, I'm quitting. Okay. So <laughs> uh, what do you want to talk about? Yeah, very much. <laughs> and okay. She says the bargains, there were two. Which two... Are, are the, so there's the, I'm trying to figure out what two bargains exactly is she referring to, right? She's referring to the bargain between her and the sea folk where they make gateways and she provides them with supplies, right? What is she supplying them with? I think just a place to go, right? There's the one bargain for the Bull of the Winds, and that's where the teachers are coming from. Right. And then there's this other bargain that... Huh, it's like she somehow brings in the gatewaying and the teaching together. Mm-hmm. So there's two bargains somehow. She's managed to make one bargain into two bargains, but it's like all on the same hinge of teaching. Well, there's the bigger bargain, right? There's the bargain between that the Amerlin will send 20 Aes Sedai to the Sea Folk, right? That's the bargain number one. But the Amerlin hasn't done that. So what they want is local teachers to get those local teachers. They made a separate bargain with Elaine and said, you will, you and your group of local Aes Sedai will tutor us in exchange for gateways. Right. Yes. And so those are the two bargains that she's trying to then renegotiate both of them at the same time and basically saying, no, I don't have to provide Aes Sedai tutors. That was part of a separate bargain, which you agreed to because you said you would make gateways and you wouldn't be doing that unless you agreed to a bargain, right? Because sea folk don't do things unless they agree to a bargain. So you admitted in that previous bargain that I am providing you a uh, a service. Yeah. And so the sea folk are trying to overlap the bargains a little bit too closely for Elaine's taste. And she's pushing back saying, no, 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 these are separate things and you don't get to bundle them together. And then Zyda is incredibly amenable to Elaine's desire to negotiate on these upfront things. And that lets you know that we're in proper bargaining space. These are not actually unreasonable demands. These are the opening salvos of a bargain. Right. Right. And they are. Zyda is very, very interested in this going down. She's a lot more eager than you normally see a sea folk. And that's because they're so they are feeling very urgently that they need to get back to their people. So playing hard to get is a card that they're leaving out of their deck this time. Ignoring the cold was all very well, but how are you supposed to ignore being cold and wet? Um, And for me, that's the thing with camping that always does me in. I'm okay with being cold, but when I'm cold and wet, I can't do it anymore. That's when I pack it in, call a hotel or biking. Like I can bike in the cold, I can bike in the wet, but when I'm cold and wet, oh man, it's just too much. Biking in the wet and then that wind chill, Mm, Mm -hmm. not fun, Mm -hmm. not fun at all. There's a whole thing about who's drinking tea and the fact that Brigida's, you know, dumping half a cup of wine down her throat in one gulp and going back for seconds because she's drinking too much. That's been a theme for the last couple of chapters. Elaine's tea is weak and Davienda is having weak tea and she's not having weak tea and it's just tiresome. But the important thing is that 
Zyda goes in there and then Elaine outweights her so they get to make a new bargain. We get to add a third bargain to the mix because more bargaining. Well, it sort of cancels out the second bargain, right? right There's the, right, still right. the big one with Egwene and the White Tower, but it cancels out that second one of training for gateways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're renegotiating the second bargain, basically. They're renegotiating. And, and she says, hey, I don't want to give up all my windfinders. You know, some of them are trainees, so you can't take them. Some of them have other duties. Some of them are advisors to more uh, ship mistresses, and they don't want to be given up, you know, basically the way you wouldn't give up Brigida. And so after all that negotiation and the back and forth, they decide to leave nine windfinders behind in exchange for making gateways. And they are going to take one Aes Sedai with them, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're going to try to take more, but they're going to at least take the one. And she's, but she's going to end up running away. That's Morel. Yes. <laughs> yes, she is like, absolutely not. Me and Talon are going to nope out of this. <laughs> and they also get one square mile of land on the river, which is something that they also negotiated with Rand. They did. This is something that, that the was interesting. folk want even when they aren't necessarily coordinating between different sea folk about these bargains, they know that in an ideal world, they have one square mile of land in every city on navigable water. And they got some with Rand, but not all of them. So they're going for that same bargain here with Elaine. They know what they want. Interesting that part of the bargain, they said they will only be asked to gateways. They must make them whenever they require, and they won't be required to fight. Remember, Brigida gets around that because she actually gets them to make a gateway when Elaine gets kidnapped, right? And she sends all the soldiers at the Black Aja literally to get slaughtered to guilt them into breaking this oath. Yep. She says, if you don't break your oath, then it's meaningless because the person that made it with you will be dead. Also, see these men dying. How much is your conscience worth it? It is brutal. It's a brutal scene. It's a brutal scene. And this this is the bargain that sets that scene up. Yeah. And it's a good action scene. This scene is rough to read and boring and terrible. And that scene <laughs> is rough to read in a totally different way. But yes, we are actually getting foreshadowing of an interesting event in the future. Hallelujah. Right. Right. So under the light, it is agreed. She, they speculate that the Windfinders who are getting left behind are the ones who lo- lost their ship during the Shanchan Chan battle. So they wouldn't have had a ship to go back to anyway. Practical. Or it seems like, yeah, sure, why not? You can earn some honor back for having lost your ship while serving the shorebound pendants. Like, fine. It's great. And, uh, yeah, that's that's it. She's made the bargain, and the beacon is still going in the west. Zooming over to the west. We get to say goodbye to Eben Hopwell. Uh, this, this is one of the best... It's one of the most iconic lines of the series, right? There's some lines of the series that stand on their own and carry all the gut punch in just a few words. And she's channeling Saidine is right? one of those sentences. And here we are at the passage where that happens. Because they set it up so much that women can't channel the male half of the power. So this, that's the only time. It's a very simple sentence, right? There, three words. And it tells you so much that, like, this person's evil, they're attacking you, they're forsaken, they're channeling the male power when they shouldn't be able to. I mean, it's just, and and then, of course, the way he sacrifices his body to give his Aes Sedai time to fight back. Yeah, the o- he does it two rivers. He, he can't fight the power, so he throws an object, but he's the so object's epic just that it's his whole yeah. ass body. I, I want to read this whole thing. Do it. It's good. All right. It's going to be gravelly, but... Because uh, Evan's an old man, right? No, he's a boy. No. Damn it. That's... I always think of... I mix up him and uh, the healer. Yeah. No, but this is the, like... It's almost like... Like, she's older than him, and it's cute. And he thinks about how he could right, love her, right, but like some right. of the people looking out in are like, is that a sibling relationship or a romance relationship? Right. Like he's real young. Eben hitched his cloak around himself and wished he were better at ignoring the cold. Simple cold he could ignore, but not the wind that had sprung up since the sun passed its zenith. The three sisters linked to him simply let the wind take their cloaks as they tried to watch every direction at once. Daigion was leading the circle, 
because of him, he thought, but she was drawing so lightly that he barely felt a whisper of Sidene passing through him. She would not want to face that until she had to. He lifted her cowl back into place on her head, and she smiled at him from its depths. The bond carried her affection to him and his own back, he supposed. With time, he thought he might come to love this little eye, said I. The torrent of Sidene far behind him had a tendency to wash out his awareness of other channeling, but he could feel others wielding the power. The battle had been joined elsewhere, and so far all the four of them had done was walk. He did not mind that much, really. He had been at Dumai's Wells, and fought the Shan Chan, and he had learned that battles were more fun in a book than in the flesh. What did irk him was that he had not been given control of the circle. Of course, Jahar had not, but he figured... Maurice amused herself by making Jahar balance a cookie on his nose. Dahmer had been given control of that circle, though, just because the man had a few years on him. Well, more than a few. He was older than Eben's Da. Was no reason for Codswain to look at him as if he were a... Could you help me? I seem to have lost my way and my horse. The woman who stepped from behind a tree ahead of them did not even have a cloak. Instead, she wore a gown of deep green silk cut so low that half her lush bosom was exposed. Waves of black hair surrounded a beautiful face with green eyes that sparkled as she smiled. A strange place to be riding, Beldine said suspiciously. The pretty green had not been pleased when Codswain put Dagion in charge, and she had taken every opportunity to state her opinions of Dagion's decisions. I hadn't meant to ride so far, the woman said, coming closer. I see you're all eyes to die with a groom. Do you know what all the commotion is about? Suddenly, Eben felt the blood drain from his face. What he felt was impossible. The green-eyed woman frowned in surprise, and he did the only thing he could. She's holding Sidene, he shouted, and threw himself at her as he felt Dagion draw deeply on the power. Ugh, pour one out for Eben. And that's it for Eben. Because we don't see it, but we get later that he died to save... And it's an emotional scene when they bring up his death as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we don't know, like, how he gets killed. We don't know how long the fight goes. We don't know, like, was it a long death, a quick death? How many back and forths did they have? We have no idea. We just know that she's cradling his body and crying uncontrollably. Like, that's, it's, you can make up whatever you want, and the truth was probably worse, right? It's that kind of a fade to black that Jordan's real good at. Real good at. So just, yeah, a couple of things. Obviously, he's not controlling the circle, so he can't channel at her. That's why he has to make the jump. This person is... Halima Arangar. Halima Arangar slash... Balthamel. Balthamel. Yes. It was not Agenor. <laughs> uh, no, this is not Agenor. was not the med scientist. I'm getting it. I'm getting nope. it. I'm getting it. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, she she does her waltzing through the woods in even less than Grandall and is is planning on basically doing the confuse them until you can walk up and stab them in the heart kind of thing. Right, which seems works really well if you have only female channelers you're contending with. But the second you're dealing with male channelers, that, that becomes a problem. Right, right. And it would be fine with dealing with male guards because boobs. Right. But a male channeler, right. that's the one like kryptonite to that disguise. But well, you gotta wonder, like, okay, this is this is a person who is in a female body, but what, couldn't you just do the same thing by like going straight up in drag, right, and really just really confusing the hell out of someone by presenting as different than your, your yeah. the way you can channel? Yeah, you you you'd think with how binary yeah. this world's gender expectations are that there would be more strategic uses of drag. <laughs> strategic uses of drag a unique sentence uttered on this podcast. i mean have you heard of the history of our military oh uh yeah just hmm. saying strategic uses of drag well more like amazing photo op uses of drag actually <laughs> but like i mean there there are times <laughs> to say nothing of like the infinity infinity number of movies that are essentially that is the gimmick is it is a entertainingly strategic use of drag like that is a 
evergreen source of inspiration for movies. Quick, we'll sneak in and put a, a veil over our face to cover the beard, and we're going to get, you know, the really big man to hunch over and put him in a dress. And yeah, you're right. I've That's been in so many fantasy novels where it's just played up for laughs. And just weird. I mean, like, you ever see Some Like It Hot with Marilyn Monroe? No. Oh, the best line at the end of the movie is this guy is falling in love with one of the heroes who's been in drag the whole movie and insisting he's going to marry her and all this stuff. And eventually he's like, you know, I smoke, I'm fat, I'm this, I'm that. And eventually like, I'm a man. And the guy's just like, well, nobody's perfect. Just keeps going. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it's a really old movie with Marilyn Monroe. Um, But it's a remarkably, it ages remarkably well in terms of the drag elements of it. As as I recall, it's just like, these guys are on the run for their life and they do what they have to do. And Marilyn Monroe ends up being their friend. And it's great. (laughs) Anything else about that little bit? I like that Eben th- thinks about how Dumais Wells has taught him that battles are more fun in a book, like that little loss of innocence oh, yeah. reminder of like, because, you know, he's he's like one of the Two Rivers boys when first leaving the Two Rivers, right? He's a teenager. He's just learning what all this adventure stuff is about. And he's disillusioned a little bit. And then he dies. And it's like, oh, our boys just didn't die because they had plot armor. But like this easily could right, have happened to right. them if they weren't plot armored. You know, I mean, to me, this feels a lot like Egwene, right? This whole like, oh, stories aren't just what they read in books because she actually wanted to go enjoy a story and then she ends up dead. Same thing with Evan. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, that's that's all I've got there. Just she's channeling Sidene. So good. Well, I'm going to go pour one out for Evan Hopwell. Yep. Yeah, we do get some really good discussions about grief as a fallout from his death. The way that right. Nynaeve yeah. and Daigion talk about warder grief and stuff. We get some very profound things in his absence, um, but it still sucks. Yeah, I would say this is the origin of a lot of the emotional tie, almost more than some of the other Aes Sedai warder stuff that we saw in the TV show yeah. that they really leaned into. Right, this sort of... Uh, emotional bonding that that really sort of comes out later um, as we get to know the Aes Sedai and the Warders a little bit better. And they're not all stoic land types who'd never like experience anything and have this high driven purpose that's going to keep them from from feeling emotions. Yeah, for sure. Chapter 13 is called High Seats, and our symbol is the Lion of Andor, because we are fully into the Andoran politics, internal Andoran on Andoran politics. Right. The, the, the Windfinders have left, and now we're just dealing with who supports the queen, who for the queen. Yeah. And this is, it's funny how much Elaine expresses doubt at having these young people, but it's like, Elaine, you aren't that much older than them. Like, you need the young people Barely. to rule. Like, that's what the pattern is calling for. Just roll with it. This, there's another society I'd like to see all the old people thrown out and young people being placed in charge of ours. <laughs> <sighs> Please. <laughs> yeah. Please. All right. So, yeah, the sea folk rush off. Then we think about how Brigida and Elaine have a weird cyclical emotion bond feedback loop thing, which is weird. And we get an excellent Linny quote, which is, when you ask questions, then you have to hear the answers, whether you want to or not, which is true. Don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. That's fun. Yes, that's that's very true. Very good Linny quote. good things that Linny ever said. What particularly interests me about this section is what I think is the reference to the Red Rod Terangriol. Yes. <laughs> right? I think this is, you know, going back and forth where Avienda is seeing the reflection of emotions between Brigida and Elaine. And she says, I think you two will make each other melt one day, she said. But then you already played that joke, Brigida Trahelion. And then later, what joke had Brigida played on her? Something that made her melt? It could not have been much if she just still did not know what it was. I think this is a reference to the night when she used the Red Rod Terangriol, right? Yeah, that's always been my assumption as well. So, because she, she doesn't remember that night. And if we remember, there is a quote where she talks about... This is Winter's Heart, A Lily in Water. They're talking about getting drunk, and Brigitte says she plans on getting drunk enough to, well, take off my clothes and dance on the table and not a hair drunker. Yes. 
And so that's the sort of the joke that's the assumption that that's what Elaine did. Yes. Right. That somehow she channeled into the thing, maybe at Brigitte's suggestion, because I think the Red Rod Terran Grail kind of makes you drunk. Right. Seems to be the effect. Like, lose your inhibitions, that sort of thing. Yeah, some, yeah. And yeah, I was trying to figure out, like, how did Brigida play into that? How? Presumably it has to do with how Brigida handled blackout drunk Elaine. Yeah, and and something about, oh, you're acting like you're going to take off your clothes and dance on the table, and then Elaine's like, that's what I'm going to do, and then does it, right? So that's the joke Brigida would have played on her by suggesting it, and then that's, Elaine went ahead and did it. Hmm. Yeah, I was overthinking it massively and trying to make it into something much more complicated without being creepy. And it wasn't working. I, I feel like this is a much simpler <laughs> simpler way of interpreting that than I was trying to make make sense. And just like making her melt, I assume that's just melt with embarrassment, right? Cause yeah, I'm assuming it's a They're feeling thing. each other's mood. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I like that, that it's Brigitte, Brigitte maybe helps that situation along in really comedically awkward ways. Uh-huh. And maybe she didn't mean to, but it happened anyway. And Right, because I can see her being like, Elaine, you're acting bloody drunk enough to get up on the table and dance with your clothes off. Like, that's a saying. Right. Like, right. you're acting that way. And Elaine's like, you're right, I'm going to do that. And then, you know... Then she is doing that, right? And and Brigitte is like, oh, I didn't mean for her to do that, but that was my saying that she took literally. Right, right. And then there was like a really long comedic scene of her like trying to get Elaine upstairs and it didn't work. And like Brigitte ended up feeling like as much in the line. Yeah, no. Oh, that would be such a funny scene. <laughs> Drunk, naked Elaine angrily trying to get back mm-hmm. to her striptease performance while like, Brigitte like desperately tries to g- wrestle her back upstairs. <laughs> Meanwhile, Avi just sitting in the back going, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Avi is heckling the whole thing, like yeah, throwing yeah. money She's at like, them. <laughs> like, yeah, completely into it. Do a spin. Right? Like, yeah. Because uh, uh, Avienda wouldn't find it embarrassing, right? No, she'd think it was hilarious and maybe a little turning on, but mostly just funny. <laughs> and then we go back into the bath. The bath water has gone cold. And to that, I say it could be a little warmer. Moving on. Refer to the first half of this episode if you want to hear us yelling about that. Um, and then we get down to this passage that gets recycled almost word for word with Egwene later in the series. With close servants, there was always a delicate balance to maintain. With that exception, a body servant knew more of your secrets than you thought she did, and she saw you at your worst. Blah, blah, blah. Respect has to go both ways. Literally, we get that same conversation with Egwene right before she leaves the Saladar camp. And, like, I get what Jordan's saying there, but it's, again, I feel like one of those scenes needed to make it to the final draft. He wrote the scene multiple times, seeing where it would make sense, seeing how different characters would play with that same concept, seeing how different servants played into the analogy better. You didn't need to keep both of them for the final story. You only needed that once. Well, But he's trying to demonstrate how good of rulers there are. It's like crossing your arms under your breasts when you're pissed, right? Or... You know, sniffing when you're upset. It's the it's these ticks where he's like, they're such good rulers. They know how to treat their servants. Right. I think that's what he's getting at as sort of a generic like in their own head. They're doing a good job. I have a very I yield disdain for the concept of servants. <laughs> I, I hate being waited on. Can't stand it. I, I would love to just be able. I like the restaurants where I can order with a QR code. Mm-hmm. And the only time I see the server is when they bring the food out. Yeah. Yeah. My grandma has invited me to go to a like week long spa getaway thing in California. And I can't even imagine myself in a place that boasts of having a four staff per client ratio. (laughs) I can't even wrap my head around it. That's why cruises sound like a nightmare, a place where I can't do anything for myself and I ask to, have to ask for help for anything I could possibly need. I don't want to ask people for help. Like once a month is too much. I don't ask for help. I suffer in silence until I figure it out. No. <laughs> uh, welcome to the millennial condition. Um. <laughs> Just give me an app. Okay. 
Just give me a I'll figure QR it out. code and like a couple of hours, I'll be fine. G- give me the, give me the tech specs and the manual and uh, Stack Overflow and um, Google, and I'll figure and, it out. And some quesadillas. Possibly some YouTube tutorials. So we go back to uh, Aramilla. You know, basically everybody's sort of sneaking in to see her because Aramilla's got the six houses and she's only got the two. Um, and so they're like, "Ooh, this does not look like she's winning, even though she's holding Camlin. So the bankers are like coming in the middle of the night with their hoods on, trying to disguise like, no, I'm not supporting her just in case Aramilla ends up winning and, you know, decides to punish anyone who is visibly supporting Elaine. Right. It's not quite the same as with the Aes Sedai backing both sides, but it's not completely dissimilar. The bankers are going to need to be in favor with the winner, regardless of who the winner is. We have a nice long digression about how Asanda is helping to train her replacement maids. And we need paragraphs of description about how Elaine is being used as a dressing doll for education. Yeah, I skip right over that. Like, this is not filler text that punches the same way the filler text in Great Hunt f- punches. No, it doesn't so much punch as, as sort of spurt out gently. Yeah, it's just <laughs> the most like limp-wristed, like flapping. Like, this is not a punch. Mm-hmm. These are words on a page that happened. Yeah. Getting to words that are interesting, Dylan has arrived. She has returned when she has brought company. The high seats of Mantiar, Haven, Gilliard, and Northen. And this is going to be maybe the most important like sub arc of Elaine's plot after wooing back all the people that Morgay's alienated is going to be dealing with this quartet of young people. I like how the solution is, oh, I just wait for the old people that she pissed off to die and I'm recruiting all their children. And that's how she's become queen. (laughs) Well, that's not exactly a strategy that she's deliberately employing, but it is working out that way (laughs) remarkably well. Um, And again, I think that the pattern is reminding us and telling us that young people need to be given the reins of power in order to deal with the future that we're all going to find ourselves in. Oh, yes. The the usual message that old people maybe shouldn't be in charge of the future because they're not going to be around for it. Yeah, maybe they should be stepping back into positions of advisors and using their experience to help young people navigate situations that they themselves never could have faced, but nonetheless have some broad insights that could help the young people, you know, skip some of the more awkward parts of the learning curve. That's why Dylan is such a great character, oh God, right? Because right? she is like, yeah, I don't want power. I, I'm, I'm not the right person to hold power. I'm... This young person is going to be a better ruler than I ever could. I will step up as an advisor and give my knowledge, but I am not going to try and take over from her. (laughs) No, that's not what Dylan's motivation is at all. She would be a fine queen. She just doesn't think she has the right. She also does say that uh, uh, that Elaine would have been is a better queen than she would. have been. She says that to her. There is a moment. Yes. Later on, after she becomes queen, where she's like, I've been around. I saw you grow up. You will be one of the greatest queens, blah, 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 much better than I would have ever been. That's why I supported you. Oh, um, I didn't remember yeah. that. Yeah, it's a whole that that, that might be later on in, in uh, might even be like a Sanderson uh, passage. <sighs> All right, fine. I guess that's her motivation. I think. <laughs> or I'm completely making it up. But usually when I'm I'm fairly confident about no, that. No, I mean, uh, I could see her saying that. I just I just really dislike the concept of monarchies and I want there to be. Nobody saying this is a good thing. I... Well, and that, one of the reasons I like Dylan is she because she doesn't support Egwene just because she's the daughter heir. She supports her because she she has seen her grow up and says specifically, I have known for a long time that you would be a good queen because I know you. Not because you were your mother's daughter, not because, you, you know, you have divine right, but because... You're smart and educated and yeah, yeah, you were born for the position, but you're also going to make an amazing queen. And so, yeah, I think Dylan's doing it for the right reasons. All right. Well, I'm working on my reread. I'm getting through my knife of dreams. I'm getting there. But OK, you're right. But yeah, it's it's nice. I mean, as Elaine even says in this chapter, like if they were older, that would just make them harder to work with. So it really is the the pattern giving her a softball, giving her an easy an easy round with these younger people who are able to be advised by Dylan, who is a really, really good advisor. She somehow has the time and headspace to be a good advisor for all of them. 
just a small aside, I'm rereading Revelation Space by Alistair Reynolds. Really love that book. It's definitely not for everybody, but man, I'm just, I'm finding a lot of respect for my intellect in the book in a way that a lot of the other books I've been reading lately don't have. Where, again, it's one of the things I appreciate most about Jordan um, that I don't find in Sanderson as much is the ability to make connections without having them all laid out for you. And it's it's a hard sci-fi, you know, and it's it's uh, definitely, like I said, it, it, the language, it, it's not a bunch of friends get together and have an adventure, right? It's It's a bunch of people who are definitely out for themselves who get united in a common goal. And then it's heavy on the the, the, the hard sci-fi. So for a lot of people, that's just like a, a, a hard no. But I just have to shout it out because I feel like it is respecting my intelligence, which is something that like, whew, I don't find in a lot of novels. Nice. Very cool. So small diversions there. <laughs> uh, so the next thing I've got is Elaine and, and Avienda being really gay. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say Brigida has this puzz- is puzzled and that that... I was like, why is she so puzzled? And that's answered later. She's puzzled because they're these four leaders are all children. That's the whole chapter theme is what are these children doing here? Yeah, basically, basically. But yeah, basically what happens next is Elaine teases Avienda because she's like in this, you know, feedback loop with Brigida. And she's like, maybe if I flirt with my girlfriend, I'll feel better. And so she starts flirting with her girlfriend by teasing Avienda and saying, hey, maybe you should dress, you know, maybe you should cosplay as a wetlander because Mm -hmm. it would it would be fun for me to look at. And also it would, you know, play well with these high seats I have to meet. And instead of, you know, pushing back and teasing back the way that she expected, Avienda goes, well, fine, but you can't twist like fine, twist my arm. Don't think you'll get away with it very often. And Elaine's like, mm-hmm. I wasn't even twisting. Like, it's yeah. <laughs> so cute how Avienda is like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Also, I very want to do this. I super want to do this. I'm going to spend yeah. a lot of time uh-huh. deciding on my clothes. I'm going to make a big show about how I don't want to do it. But also, like, that was zero twisting on Elaine's part. And it's so gay and so cute. It's also a bit of a reminiscent of Nynaeve, how her, yeah. oh, Two Rivers uh, Wollens are good enough, but then, like, she's in perfectly cut, super nice silks all the time, and you're like, wait a minute, you picked those out and got them made and put them on. Well, Elaine got these made for Avi, I think, in this in this case, yeah, but yeah, it's that. that, like, yeah. she puts on her, like, good stout Algoda blouse and her thick shawl, and then the second that she can put on her silks, she doesn't just, like, grab the first thing. No, she like pours over it and like thinks about every single one. And it's just so cute. It kind of reminds me of someone like going to their first prom and like wearing nice clothes, like trying to figure out like how to wear a dress nicely for the first time in their life. Because in a lot of ways, Avienda delayed her emotional relationship uh, rela- uh, life until now. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, she, she's never really thought about guys or looking pretty or dressing up or really anybody. Yeah, it's, it's there's even a passage here where it talks about how, you know, compliment her on on a skill she's developed and she knows how to handle that, but compliment her on her beauty and she's completely flummoxed because it was a part of herself she had managed to ignore until recently. Also implies that Elaine does a lot of complimenting her on her beauty. It does. It does. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> But yeah, it was, it's Elaine's like, you know, oh, you look so beautiful. And Avienda's just like, I hate it when you tell me I'm beautiful. <laughs> and it's just so sweet. More about Elaine's eating behaviors and how everyone sucks at getting her to eat food. And they're, they're trying to force her to eat this gruel. And she's like, congealed hey, if you want me to eat it, I'm going to make like, yeah, uh, ugh, uh, cold oh, congealed God, oatmeal. God, mucilaginous. It's like, I'm going to make you eat it too, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you make me eat it. You're going to sit down and eat it, too. And they're like, nope, nope. OK, we're good. Never mind. That's fine. We don't need it. And it's like, yeah, it's gross. You know that. Why are you trying to force a pregnant lady to eat gross shit? Don't you know you get her pickles and ice cream whenever she wants it? Not this fucking like bland ass oatmeal and weak watery tea. Yeah, you give her what she craves and you, you stand back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to get a finger in there because you'll yeah. lose it. That's like it's ridiculous, especially mm, I just mm. Mm. But it is good physical comedy that they're like, it looks so good. And then she insists they have to eat it. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's 
if if this was the only scene about Elaine's pregnancy diet shenanigans, this would be amazing. Right. It would be really funny. It's just that we've seen this played out six, seven, eight times. Now. Yeah, it was funny the first two times and now it's not. But as a person who hates oatmeal, I, I do appreciate the shade being thrown at oatmeal by RJ here. See, I do love oatmeal, but I will admit it has a timer on it, right? Like there is a there's a time beyond which oatmeal is no longer edible. And that time is when it gets cold. Right? Like it just turns into this mass of bleh. And you can add more hot water to kind of recover it sometimes. But then you're just eating watery oatmeal. And yeah, at that point. But I'll tell you what, get yourself some seal cut oats, cook those down, much better, because it's got texture to it. The closest I ever got to liking oatmeal was with steel cut oats. But yeah. I ultimately couldn't make it actually a thing I could like, but almost, steel cut oats, almost. I, just oatmeal and um, camping bike trips go hand in hand, because it's like, uh, you can dry it, just heat up some water, and it's enough fuel, it's dense enough, and if you're biking, you're hungry enough, you'll eat it. <laughs> I, I, having done a big ass hiking trip a couple of times, I, I can believe that oatmeal would go down just fine if that was the context it was presented to me. And I'd be like, ooh, calories. How nice. I also tend to make oatmeal with a little more water than most people. So I, I, to get it far away from that congealed state, you get it just a little more watery. And it's almost like oatmeal soup at that point. But then you can just, I can just slurp it right down, especially if I'm dehydrated or whatever from sure. hiking. Yeah. So, yeah, for the next two pages we have physical descriptions of three boys and one girl and i don't know that any of that matters in the slightest i have nothing i'd really i just want to skip right over okay, it cool you know there's a little bit about their personalities and how the obvious thing is you can't let an any like aramilla take the throne well no shit sherlock it takes a child to point that out right like why are these six houses supporting aramilla she's an idiot and it's politics and blackmail, and it takes children to be like, no, she's dumb. Support the one that's not dumb. Right, right. It's like, hmm, do we go with the house that our family has generally supported who's not headed by a dumb person, or do we change trajectory to the dumb person? Right, Like, this right. is not a difficult choice for me, a child, to make. <laughs> yeah, and we get some context about how one of them, like, has a more complicated extrication story than the other three. And it's just like, none of that matters. Like the Gilliards never show up banging down Elaine's door, demanding their stolen air back. Like none of that buildup matters in the slightest. About the only thing that matters is that the little boys are checking out the women's bottoms and they get offended about that. But it's like, dude, they're teenage boys and you're wearing tight pants. What are you expecting? Well, it's not the women's bottoms. It's Birgitta specifically. There is a whole ass well, conversation she's the one wearing the pants. about yeah. how yeah. like dialing and Brigida have a whole ass conversation about the fact that these boys were both looking at Brigida's ass. And can we not victim blame the woman for wearing tight pants? Can we not victim blame the teenagers for being teenagers? Can we just allow the scene to exist without needing to make it a morality play? Please. Right. Yeah. That's all I'm like. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. Right. Tight pants are fine. Looking at people's butts who wear tight pants is fine. Just don't stare. You know. And, like, you're a teenager, so you're not staring is real awkward. It's okay. It's real awkward and like, obvious, and you haven't figured out how to take that quick glance. Is that, you yeah, know. like, it doesn't need to be a reason for grown women to snip at each other. It can just be a thing that all the adults in the room roll their eyes at and pretend isn't happening. Like, but no, we need to drive home how Brigida and Dylan can't get along, and they have to use slut-shaming as their sparring platform of choice, and it's just tiresome a little bit yep yep honestly of the four kids i think the most interesting one is catlin catelyn because because sure. i feel like you see bits of elaine and dylan in her like she's very proud very self-assured and just needs a bit of seasoning and you know she's i don't know you just see the sense of like this is what like a proper andorra noble lady is like she's a little bit rushes ahead a little bit green to be in power but like ultimately she's going to mellow into something really awesome but it's it, she doesn't do anything interesting. She just has the potential to be a decent person, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I'm right there. We, the, there's the quote about uh, why Brigitte doesn't wear a sword because the army is her sword. And most generals, you know, Gareth Brynn quote saying the army is your sword. You don't need to carry one. Despite the fact that Gareth Brynn carries a sword, I guess. Uh, again, this is a and this is an adult woman sparring with a child over adult issues. It's like, wh why are you? 
Well, but that's the whole point, right? They have to get into adult issues because these people are in charge of their respective groups. And so, you know, the whole point they're making is like, hey, that Dylan makes actually is I wasn't that much older people. The pattern says you have to grow up sometimes and these children are stepping up to the plate and you have to respect them for that. Even if they don't have the experience, they are taking on the responsibility and, and you have to treat them as though they have the responsibility no matter what age they are. Which I disagree with strongly. I feel like it is, there's a age range with a floor and a ceiling at which serious decisions <laughs> should be getting made. And outside of that, like, you have other things to do. Like, if you're a child, you need to be learning how to human. And if you're an old person, then you need to be dispensing advice. And, and, and in a normal society, without the last battle coming and people dying in weird times i would agree with you but that's why we have a democracy where we elect leaders as opposed to having an inheritance where the child gets yeah i just put into a leader yeah a position of leadership the concept of inherited power is nonsense it's bad yeah it's bad like inherited wealth is a tricky concept inherited power is absolutely not a good idea well you think inherited wealth isn't inherited power as a person with inherited wealth i'm going to insist that they're different because i need to preserve my ego thank you (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. as i'm gonna disagree with you there (laughs) yeah because you have no inherited wealth coming your way i I absolutely have (laughs) inherited wealth coming why and i absolutely have benefited from my parents wealth and they have benefited from their parents wealth who benefited from all all sorts of bad things um so yeah no I'm, I'm certainly not trying to say i'm independent of inherited wealth but you know you think that this podcast doesn't exist because both of us have some independence and freedom to do what we want because of inherited wealth like, <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by inherited wealth <laughs> <laughs> you're not wrong and, you're not and wrong how many of our uh patrons who are paying us are paying us out of the sense of having a little bit of spare recreational money to spend on fun art projects because of inherited wealth. I'm, I'm going to say every one of our patrons is a hardworking person that has earned their money of their own free will and on their own. They have never had any help from any outside uh, person and anything they give us comes out of their own absolute hard work. And, and don't you dare disparage our patrons. Please keep giving us money. <laughs> <laughs> In fairness, when I was a patron of this podcast, it was out of my library paycheck very specifically that I was mm-hmm. doing the calculation to be like, that's where my money is coming from, technically. But, you know, people with inherited wealth are more likely to sponsor podcasts. Just broadly right, speaking. Right, because your your library money didn't have to go to things like housing and right. food. Right. I was able to afford to work 10 hours a week just to yes. keep my brain sane, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just I feel like inherited power is a thing that this world very much. R- Robert Jordan really likes the concept of inherited power. It can go to the right people. And like he makes that argument. And I just I disagree with that thesis entirely. <laughs> and so I was like, yes, children can grow up quickly when the last battle calls for it. But also... Maybe you shouldn't have a structure where this is what they're called to do. I I understand he has that, but I would almost say in fantasy, he gets as far away from it as anyone ever had at that time. Right. Inherited wealth is something that has been around in all the fantasy for a very long time. Sort of Shannara, all about inherited power. Tolkien, all about inherited power. Right. Like. Yeah, I do find it a little boring. Yeah. To me, Jordan democratizes power in a way in that anyone can learn to channel anyone could learn to channel right yeah two percent of the population yeah two percent of the population anyone yeah but it's not tied up with nobility it's not tied up in any sort of you know rand happens to be the son of kings and queens but he didn't that's not why he got power yeah, it's a pure coincidence that seven ace of the relevant cast members are all related to people. That yeah, are in power pure coincidence. Each other. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um, feel like there's probably some pretty good ex- exceptions to that, but you're right. As a trope, the concept of inherited power is pretty universal within this genre. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's some good ex- mm-hmm. exceptions out there, but yeah, it's. 
Spinalco is pointing out, Terry Brooks is very hard to read. And I will say a lot of the 80s authors are very hard to go back and reread. A lot of authors who wrote in the like 70s and 80s, early sci-fi, early fantasy. I go back and read that. And there's just so much stuff in there that's just cringeworthy by today's standards. Just read Not Men from the period. Yeah, they're harder to find because they didn't get published as much. And they didn't get as famous. They exist, but they are harder to find. Yeah, there's this real cool thing I've heard of called the Internet in Five Minutes. Just you, can, you give it a go sometime. Are you saying I haven't? <laughs> uh, yes, actually, I am. Just, just a skosh. Just a skosh. This may or may not be related to a secret project that I may or may not be making. Not so much secret if you keep spreading it all over the podcast that's going out to thousands of people. Do you want to finish this chapter? Do we have to? <laughs> uh, let's see. What's left? Um, so the kids are talking about how many people they brought. They brought a whole bunch. They brought uh, 3,000 soldiers. Very handy. And then they all leave to go to their apartments. And we talk with Dylan about how uh, for for this morning, for no reason I could make out, Mistress Corley was standing in staring and gaping like a goose girl and might not have made the gateway and we know it's because of the beacon you know the the cleansing going off you know dylan thinks maybe it's just because the kinswoman don't have the right nerve to pretend to be as to die but that's completely beside the point that doesn't go anywhere so moving on elaine thinks about how the beacon has been unchanging for hours, and anyone who channeled for this long without a rest must have fallen over with exhaustion. This is roughly when Nynaeve is whimpering, no more, please no right. more, and, and Kazan right. actually lowers the shield power just a little bit to give Nynaeve just some basic like physical endurance, like healing refreshment, because mm -hmm. she is being kind of... I mean, I would assume that if this went on too long without any support, Nynaeve would ultimately die of just exhaustion. It's the way I imagine people who reach the end of a marathon and just collapse and, you know, sometimes can have heart failure. Yeah. From just sheer exhaustion, right? And dehydration and the inability for your body to replace all the electrolytes that you were using and all the uh, and all the energy and the ATP and everything. So it's like, yeah, you can you can really work yourself to death in pure exhaustion, which is a totally separate mechanism from burning out on the one power. Right. That's like magical and only happens with the magic stuff. But like, no, there are like many, many instances in the real world of people working themselves to a point of physical exhaustion and being unrecoverable from it. And I do think that Nynaeve is is flirting with that edge. Rand is driving both of their bodies just up to that edge. And and you know the difference between Rand and Nynaeve? He's a warder. So he's got more natural, magical, physical endurance. It's the warder so bond. he's got. It, I bet that makes a big difference. Like it can't be because he's physically large. It can't be because he's male. Like, even within the rules of the world, neither of those things give an advantage. But being a warder, being a double warder. He's able that. to pull double warder. He's able to pull the endurance from the bond that keeps him awake longer, gives him more stamina, all that kind of stuff. That makes sense. Plus, his Chodon call access key doesn't break. So I'm assuming that whatever flaw is rattling the female one apart is probably also making it a little harder on Nynaeve. I don't know, but I'd like to think that there's something there. But I, you're, I think you're right that the water bond is the bulk of what, what that difference is. Well, and she is much more creating a weave that is the funnel that the power is traveling through. He is tr just funneling pure power, right? And she's actually adding structure to it. Yeah, I, mm, I thought he did the weaving. Well, sorry, the female half of the source has structure. Oh, so you think that she's kind of more like experiencing the the strain of being that filter? Exactly. Yeah. Or or at least maybe it takes more power to maintain the shape of the filter than to just have raw power. To hold the bank. She is the she's the bank containing the river. And he exactly. is the actual yes. river. Yeah. Is the is the uh, river. Oh, yep. yeah, so she's getting eroded harder. Whereas the river's just picking up extra material, but the bank is actually being chiseled into. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they're both very, very tired, and I think sleep for like 30 hours after the event. Like A long time, he's, yeah. He's it's 5% it's big... less exhausted than she is. <laughs> right. He, he collapses slightly after she right. does. Like, 
Yeah. Brigitte gives some shit about a way about Hawkwing, where she's like, you know, Hawkwing never fought anybody's flaming champion. Oh, yeah. This whole, like, expletive-filled history lesson about how duels do not determine wars, which is fine. <laughs> and meanwhile, Tylan's being like, how do you know that? Yeah, like, Tylan's like, you are not helping me not wonder about your backstory, lady. <laughs> right, right. So hanging out with Arthur Hawkwing, were you? That, um... And like, come on, she goes by Brigida. It's not that she carries a silver bow. It's not that hard for people to go. Wait, is she actually Brigida? Like the Dragon Reborn's hanging right? around. Like, why not? It seems yeah, like a like, silly secret to hang on to. But it's one of Brigida's weird flaws is that she needs people to pretend that they don't know she's Brigida. I think that comes from the precepts, right? She's not allowed to help and share who she is with people in Teleron Riyadh. And so when she gets kicked out, I think she still feels that, like, I don't want people to know I'm Brigida, both from a personal standpoint, but also, like, I feel like she's kind of breaking the rules of being a hero of the horn by sharing that she is the right, hero of the horn. Right, right. Yeah, it's kind of like how one traumatizing thing happens to you when you're three, and then you can never take a compliment from someone for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That's a really brilliant uh, thought. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way you immediately were uncomfortable the second I said that. <laughs> Ew. Uh, you're like, no. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'll go through the funnel power system probably. Once we reach the end of the Winter's Heart stuff, I'll probably walk through it one more time. But it's definitely in the episode that we the, the beginning of Crossroads of Twilight, chapter one. I think we go through uh, that in detail. If you want to go back and listen to that episode. Uh, we get an interesting comment that I think is important, at least for me, to always remember when I think about, like, why do people join militaries? Why do people have allegiance to their nation state? And why do people care about the ultimate ruler at the top of their massive nation? The men who ride for them will fight to keep them alive. But it, it is Paraval and Branlet, Conail and Catalan that they ride for, not me. And like, it just, I, I don't know, I'm on a history bender the last several months. And I just, it blows my mind that people will like, rip themselves up from their little hamlets and go off to like, stab guys in France with like, you know, their farming implements because the king said so. And it's it's not because the king said so. It's because there's this whole chain of command of things that go all the way down to like local lords saying, you are the five guys that I trust to come with me. And that just stacks up until you end up with an army of 5,000 people. But it's all made up of these smaller and smaller subunits that ultimately point at the ruler. But are, it, most of these guys could give a shit about Elaine, ultimately, but they give a shit about Bob, who gives a shit about Steve, who gives a shit about Paraval, and thus we have an army. And for me, at least, that paragraph always reminds me, like, this is what's happening in the background of the world. This is how 90% of Randland's population is organizing themselves, is according to those lines that have nothing to do with our main characters. James Islington, who wrote a series I've talked about in the past, uh, a trilogy called Lycanus series or cycle or something like that. Um, he just came out with a new book like two days ago called The Will of the Many, which is all about how um, in order to gain magic power, you essentially have to, ha everyone has like one magic unit and you have to get people to pledge their magic units to you. And then those people pledge a portion of their magic to people above them who pledge, pledge a portion of their magic to people above them. And that goes all the way up in terms of um, almost a Roman style series of, of magical uh, power where the person at the top has just insane abilities because they have the magic power of, you know, however many hundred thousand people. And so that, that just reminds me a little bit. But it's it's very much based around the army structure of the Roman Empire seems to be where he's getting his structure. And I don't know if you can oh, hear yeah. Timber in the background. But he, yeah. <laughs> he is he's lying on the I got a spot of sunlight right here on the ground that he is lying in and he is rolling around um, giving us a <laughs> As soon as I stop talking, he stops mm -hmm. rumbling, but giving us a, a concert. This comment, some women dial in muttered into her wine, can make fish bite by crooking a finger, Lady Brigida. Other women have to drag their bait all over the pond. 
<laughs> I mean, that is cold. That's like, that cold. is for the jugular right there. That is yeah, that's brutal. really bad. It's like your tight pants are just displaying your bait. Yeah, like to everybody out there. You are dressed like a cheap hoe. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is basically like what you're saying. You are saying. dressed like a street hooker. Like that is mm-hmm. the level mm-hmm. of of vile. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's so mm-hmm. snarky. It's just this is this is a lady of the court who knows how to throw a mean mean insult and mm-hmm. It's I don't like the relationship between the two of them. I love the punch of that line. It is so zesty, <laughs> so zingy. Just, mm. If it was in isolation, I wouldn't hate their relationship at all. It's so funny. Uh, I, I do like that Jordan's trying to portray, you know, not everybody has to get along to work towards a common goal. Yes. But we see that so often with the women and not so much with the men. And to have the women like going down to the like well you have too much cleave to be taken seriously instead of being like you're an idiot who only thinks that charging is the way to do strategy right like there are other things to insult than her fashion sense but it's women so they're catty and right right but yeah i agree it is nice to see two people who are very definitely good who are very definitely friends with our hero who are very definitely working for the same goals striking sparks over absolutely nothing it is good to remember that people don't get along because they're on the right side they get along because they happen to get along being on the right side isn't you're not going to like everyone you get along with like more people in our political system need to understand (laughs) that you are not going to agree personally individually with people on everything and you're still going to be working together and needing to work together but we agree on everything which is nice yeah, it is. It is good. It's it's part of how the podcast <laughs> is so full of interesting and different ideas comes from us agreeing all the time. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, yeah, we we never disagree on anything. We do agree on a lot of things. <laughs> we but, are kind of the same person, like way too often. <laughs> but do you want to read us out? Yeah, I'll I'll give us I'll give us a readout here. Maybe like a wave of cold air. That was exactly where I was going to yeah. start. Yeah. See, we agree on stuff. I know. (laughs) (laughs) A wave of cold air swept into the room as the door opened, and Rosoria entered, coming to a stiff attention. The first maid and the first clerk have come, my lady Elaine, she announced. Her voice faltered at the end as she caught the mood in the room. A blind goat could have caught it, with Dylan smug as a cat in the creamery, and Brigida scowling at her and Avienda both and Avienda choosing this moment to remember that Brigida was Brigida Silverbow, which on this occasion made her stare at the floor, as abashed as if she had been laughing at a wise one. Now and again, Elaine wished her friends could all get on as well as she and Avienda did, but somehow they managed to rub on together, and she supposed that was really all she could ask from real people. Perfection was a thing for books and Gleeman stories. Send them in, she told Rosoria, and don't disturb us unless the city is under attack. Unless it is important, she amended. In stories, women who gave orders like that were always setting themselves up for disaster. Sometimes there were lessons in stories, if you looked for them. Definitely foreshadowing the destruction of Camelon there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Send them in and don't disturb us unless the city is under attack. Yeah. I think Jordan's foreshadowing that the city is going to be under attack. A yeah, bit. yeah, yeah. Because there's no way that he didn't know he was going to burn Camelon to the ground at this point. Like, that's definitely right. already mapped out. He's got so many plot pieces moving that direction. And I love his fourth wall breaking of, like, people have to be... Their people are in stories are different than people in real life. and But there's still lessons in stories. And he's like, I'm telling you about the real world. <laughs> you can right. hear him yelling through the fourth wall at us like, I have uh-huh. real life experience. I buried in this story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trying to teach you I young people how to up. live through yeah. the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think with that. We've made it through the worst of the Elaine train. Yeah. I think we've got one more episode, right, next week uh, to finish out the Elaine stuff. We've got some more, yeah, Nori. Yeah, Nori and Mistress Halfor and Yeah. Yeah, we've got, and then we get into Elaine's enemies. We get to hang out with them for a bit. That's pretty fun. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But that's, the evil people are always interesting, right? Like, it doesn't. Yeah. 
I always yeah. love that. And then and then we've got a big Egwene chunk. It looks like we've got six Egwene chapters with some and then some Alviar and, and some Egwene evil folks. Right. Definitely. Definitely a pattern that he's following here, which is a couple of chapters of this person, a chapter or two of their enemies switch POVs. We did Perrin, then Elaine, then Egwene, then Rand, then back to Perrin, then Matt. And then the end of it is uh, some quick Perrin, Matt, Egwene, Rand, like all, all four at once. So the end of this book, actually, there's some decent chunks in here. The last, I want to say, five, seven, seven chapters, really, uh, bounce around between all our main characters. And it's, it's clear that he's setting up what's going to happen in Knife of Dreams, right? Rand is about to meet the daughter of the mine, mine moon. So Egwene gets captured. Matt sort of finishes up with Tuan. He doesn't quite marry her, but he's like kind of finishing his like courtship of her. And Perrin throws away the axe. So it's all sort of like big character moments getting ready for the next the next book where a lot of really interesting things happen. Yeah, I think that with today's episode, we have gotten through the worst of the Elaine portion of the slog. We've really put most of that behind us. And it's it's all going to start sliding downhill from here. And we've gotten through the worst of the parent stuff already as well, mm-hmm. right? Like we we busted through that. So really, there's a I think a Gwen section is the most interesting of them, even though it is still a little slow. But I think that is the hardest, and and I think having the uh, the little bits of Winter's Heart is helping out. Speaking of which, speaking of which, I I, I was like, oh, we're done. Right. Nope, we have a Winter's Heart POV that I completely forgot it, this about. This is the third of the three Sindane POVs, where we've got three times that she shows up and tries to get there to kill Luz there, and this is the third time, and this is when she gets rebuffed by Olivia, which is a fun battle. Sindane slowed at the sight of the woman standing among the trees a hundred paces ahead of her, a tall, yellow-haired woman who simply watched her come closer. The feel of battles being fought with the power in other places made her wary at the same time it gave her hope. The woman was dressed plainly in wool, but incongruously decked with gems as if she were a great lady. With Sidar in her, Sindane could see the faint lines at the corners of the woman's eyes. Not one of those who called themselves eyes to die, then. But who? And why did she stand there as if she would bar Sindane's way? It did not really matter. Channeling now would give her away. But she had time. The key still shone as a beacon of the power. Luce Theron still lived. No matter how fierce the other woman's eyes, a knife would do for her, if she really thought she could be a bar. And just in case she proved to be what they called a wilder, Sindane prepared a small present for her, a reversed web she would not even see until it was too late. Abruptly, the light of Sidar appeared around the woman, but the ready ball of fire streaked from Sindane's hand, small enough to escape detection, she hoped, but enough to burn a hole through the woman who, just as it reached the woman, almost close enough to singe her garments, the web of fire unraveled. The woman did not do anything. The net simply came apart. Sindane had never heard of a Turangrial that would break a web, but it must be that. Then the woman struck back at her, and she suffered her second shock. She was stronger than Sindane had been before the Aelfin and the Eelfin held her. That was impossible. No woman could be stronger. She must have an Angrial, too. Shock lasted only the time it took her to slice the other woman's flows. She did not know how to reverse them. Maybe that would be enough advantage. She would see Luce there and die. The taller woman jerked as her cut flows snapped back into her. But even as she shifted her feet with the blow, she channeled again. Snarling, Sindane fought back, and the earth heaved beneath their feet. She would see him die. She would. No, she won't. Spoilers for the end of the book. She will never see him die. No, because she dies at the end of the series when Perrin breaks her neck, and I will not be discussing any alternative uh, storylines. I don't know why you would bring up the concept of other storylines. No, because clearly she dies in that moment. But for now, she's fighting with a lady who doesn't have Botox. Wow. Oh, no. Right. So this is Olivia, who they don't mention her name, but she is the Sean Chan Damani who was freed 400 years old, probably the most powerful channeler that we encounter, or at least on that tier of the even above Forsaken tier. I think in which there are like two or three people. And she's also got Angrial 
on top of that. I believe she is, in fact, amplified above her own natural capacity. Yes, she has the she both she has the bracelet and rings, as well as the all the the jewelry that Nynaeve had. So she is supercharged. She's got Cod Swain's physical barrier. You know, Matt's. But basically, Matt's on Griol that unravels the weaves. She's super powerful. Like, I'm surprised, honestly, that Lampier made it out of there. It is very impressive that she survived the encounter. <laughs> yeah, you'd think Olivia would have just destroyed her, given that she's a weapon. And Lampier doesn't have an on No, all. not in the slightest. She's got diminished power and no toys. How does she survive this encounter? Clearly because she's more interested in running away than in killing Olivia. That would be my assumption, yeah, as she runs. And Olivia is probably more interested in defending the perimeter than killing anyone who is willing to stay on the other side of the line. Mm -hmm. And we get this is the confirmation for any of the readers who hadn't decided that she was Lanfear yet. Jordan decided to just say, yes, this is Lanfear. This is Lanfear. She was stronger than Sindane had been before the Aelfin and the Eelfin held her. Right? So unless it's uh, Moraine. Right. <laughs> who's the only other person, which we know it's not. And she's been talking like Lanfear this whole time and the only reason that we thought she wasn't Lanfear was because her power level was different. And here is the line that lets us know that the Aelfin and Eelfin can literally change the amount amount of power you can access they can eat the ability out of you we didn't know that was an option before this no and but and later we do find out that they've been doing that to moraine quite yep. a bit that's why moraine is now a really really low ranked sister unless she's got that uh, particular angriol on her wrist um, and I, one of the things I really like about this Winter Hearts chapter is we get so many Forsaken POVs. A lot of our theories are confirmed in Chapter 35 of Winter's Heart. Like a lot of a lot of little nuggets of information are dropped that because it's from a Forsaken POV, it's either been speculation or one of several options up to this point that we're able to eliminate all the other options and and really. You know, a lot of things that we've been talking about in the series, we can point to this chapter and be like, look, we know for sure that this is land fear. Mm -hmm. This is this is where we know. This is when we learn for sure. Yeah, that's all I got for that. Sindane, not as important for the ending as I thought she would be, but still important. I mean, she's been a bogeyman since the very beginning. Right, right. Her just her how much she was involved with Rand from the beginning as an independent contractor is just like wow, like when you, when you go back and realize and realize the entirety of the Great Hunt is Land Fear doing stuff almost entirely right like she is the bad guy of the Great Hunt the second book yeah uh, more so than you, who you think it would be which is Ishamael at the time yeah she's doing the classic bad guy stuff of being ahead and behind you never know which face you're talking to might actually be her in disguise she's manipulating people really subtly she's playing games within games she's playing the whole game she's every side of it she's showing up in the middle of the night in a spotless white dress she's vanishing between one step and the next she's an old woman she's in the wind as you open the letters right like She's so, she's Else Grinwell. She's so classic bad guy and everything you would expect from the Forsaken back then. And she, the Aelfin eat a lot of her plot potential along with her ability to channel. <clears throat> and I think with that, my voice has reached its limit. With that note, I just want to remind everyone that we're going to start just having a list of affiliate links in our episode descriptions, as well as any books that we talked about in the episode. You can always find those in the episode description. You can support us on Patreon. You can find us on social media. You can find lots and lots and lots of podcasts about the Wheel of Time on the internet, and I encourage you to do that. And otherwise, you should drink water and not get sick like Seth. Go pet your dog if you have one. And so if your girlfriend gets sick, just don't take care of her. Just totally abandon her. Walk away. It's the only way to avoid being sick, I swear. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah, now I've been editing it today, and I, I only just finished the the content edit right before we, we I came onto this meeting. And so then after we finish here, I have to still go back and add the transitions and mm -hmm. the commercial, and then export it and upload it. I still haven't haven't done that pass that part of it yet. Um, oh, I always did that in the same pass. Yeah, I like just blasting through it and dropping markers behind me. Gotcha. And then I can. That just makes sense really, too. Yeah. I can because then I can zoom out and just like yeah, it's uh, because I I edit them at a quite high rate of speed. Yeah, batch processing. I'm all about it. <laughs> but yeah, it's like. Yeah, I <laughs> I asked the universe for more podcasting projects and the universe was like, what if what if too many? What if too many podcasting projects? It's like, thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> so you know that's how it works. It's feast or famine. There's never a little bit. It's Yeah. How would you like to do everything all at once? Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm getting what I asked for and that's good. But yeah, I know what I'm doing this week. <laughs> <laughs> working. Yeah, actually working, actually having worked. And that's the other funny thing is if I sit around on my ass and do nothing, then I feel like I don't have anything to do. And if I start trying to feel responsible to do things instantly, there are too many things to do and it's overwhelming. Like all I did was try to be a little responsible and now I'm behind. If I was being no responsible, I wouldn't be behind. But by trying to be responsible, now I'm behind. It's paradoxical. But such is the life of an artist, I guess. I'm an artist. Tortured. Tortured and starving. That's me. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. You see, you're really starving there out in the, the countryside. Yeah. Yes, me On your... and my plentiful eggs. <laughs> <laughs> They're so good and they get delivered to our house now by the neighbor across the way that has chickens it's excellent oh that's nice yeah we've been getting our eggs from uh never's parents they have chickens Ooh. in their backyard very nice so we don't always get them we still buy chicken eggs from the store sometimes because uh we don't always want to see her parents um <laughs> Fair. <laughs> uh, but when we do go see them we get you know like two dozen eggs uh that are just freshly out of the the back of the the hen house so yeah it's been nice to eat really good quality eggs yeah, it's a very, very distinct difference to uh, to chicken eggs when they're eating bugs and running around. It's just, uh, God, they taste so much better and they're so much oranger. You abandoned me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like I went out for a pack of cigarettes. Uh, I don't know, so. Well, I just thought I'd go work on another podcast real quick. Oh, okay. Seriously? <laughs> well, yeah, actually. <laughs> well, if I was like, I gotta go, like, you know, use the restroom, and I came back, I'm like, oh, right, I can, like, delete some of these pieces out of the way that I have the template set up for TVAD. Like, oh, I don't mm -hmm. need the news track, and, like, I can just kind of delete a few things and remind myself where I'm at. Let's get it set up for actually going back and putting the things in, like I need to once I'm done here. TVAD hasn't had many episodes lately. They they took a big break there for a while. Yeah, they've had some real, real because for them, like if they miss a week, they they can't make it up again until the next week. So like, Justin gets sick one week. There's like a big event the next week, and then Jess is sick the next week, and it's like, oh, it's been three weeks without any content. Right, right, right. Yeah, so I was. It's always. Um, it's a. It's a serious gamble every week. I'm like, oh, will I have an episode to edit? Who knows? <laughs> I just. I just feel like we do a better job of suffering through our sickness and producing content, no matter what. Hustle culture, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gotta hustle for those podcasts. It's because, but the thing is that they all have real jobs, and until recently, neither of us had a real job. That's true. And even right. and well, you, hey, I mean, my cooking. Yeah, I was part time. You had but, a series yeah. of jobs that were far more flexible than like actual jobs. Whereas I think, like, well, actually, Jess was unemployed for fun employed for a while there. Oh, I'm just, I'm just making. I'm. I think we have a remarkable um, ability to show up here every week because we're ridiculous introverts. 
and that's, that's <laughs> a real problem <laughs> it's like oh yeah we uh we don't want to go anywhere we're gonna be in our house are you gonna be in your house tonight yep me too okay let's do a podcast mm. really? <laughs> and then it's like oh you want me to go do something sorry i can't i have a podcast a podcast <laughs> yeah darn. i'm not gonna be able to <laughs> gotta do stay anything. home and talk sorry. to a computer for a couple hours yeah my shoot. internet friends are more important than you <laughs> my internet friends are my friends it's literally true <laughs> I don't know who you are. You're just like someone I have to work with because we happen to get a job in the same location. <laughs> I don't really care about you yeah. or your house or whatever. The, 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 the people that I actually choose to spend time with. Right. They're, they're either in my house right now or on the Internet. In my head. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I think we've, we've, we have been very good through all the years of being consistent and producing content yeah i hate it when my favorite podcasts don't so i try to be the podcaster i want to see in the world (laughs) it's i also like it's not like we're waiting for inspiration right we have content to get through we're not it's not like this week we're like oh shoot we didn't we didn't come up with an idea for what we're going to talk about this week no it's it's the next chapter Mm -hmm. it makes it much easier to to not have to be creative just to get started we have to be creative while we're working but it, it, it's a remarkable workaround to have content to talk about yeah and we yeah and you and i can pre- prepare completely independently just by being like two chapters today okay mm-hmm. that's all we have to say before we you know just verify that we're doing two, those two chapters that's true only takes several years to build a rhythm like just that. well yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening to the wheel of time spoilers podcast Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?